Everett. You know how astronauts have those like big helmets that help them breathe in the vacuum of outer space? How do you think they scratch their noses? It's a great, great question. Um, maybe sticking like a pencil up their, up their helmet or I don't know, rubbing their face against it. <laughs> Yeah, they're not, they're not, they're, hey. they, they actually rub their face against it. So I had to oh, yeah. this up and apparently they use this foam pad in their helmet to do it. Or they like, you know, MacGyver by like scratching their head on the, on the mic. Um, yeah. But it yeah. really rustles my jimmies when the thing keeping me alive presents me from, uh, prevents me from getting the sweet, sweet relief of a, of a, of a nose itch. But uh, mm. let's first, welcome to How It's Med, the podcast where we sometimes talk about nose itches, but most importantly, where we chat with people who are shaping the future of health tech. Uh, and healthcare. My name is Jeff, and this time we have the CEO of Clarivet, Arpin Grover, with us. Arpin, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you guys? A uh, solid mid, solid mid. As uh, yeah. as I as I said, I am exhausted, but it is okay because I am talking with you in your wonderful mm -hmm. backlit office. <laughs> yeah, I mean, been here all day. Been here all Monday morning, and it's been tiring it's been in the lab all day but i'm excited to talk to you guys i mean i mean apart apart from being in the lab and like mm -hmm. what else do you do it i mean are you are you just like 24 hours ceo okay <laughs> no i mean i try to take breaks as much as i can um in terms of like my working day it'll be waking up normal time um whenever the work day starts could be a meeting at 7 a.m what's could normal be... time i'm sorry <laughs> Like a normal yeah, just... time could be like a 7 a.m. meeting or it could be like a 10 a.m. So it just depends on usually when my first meeting is. And if I have no meetings in the morning, I'll usually try to get up around 9. Um, and a lot of my work is done here in Burnaby at BCIT. So I'll come in. Um, if there's any lab work to do, I'll, I'll start doing that. And we're doing a lot of prototyping right now. So we've received some feedback from physicians on our product and it's doing some iterations on that. So... 60% of my time will be doing lab work here at BCIT, but then um, the other 40% will be talking to customers. So that'd be like talking to doctors, talking to people at the hospital. So people part of the decision-making process, the buying process, or uh, talking with potential partners, with manufacturers, um, talking with podcast people like you guys. So doing like outreach and PR, that's also a big part of it. Um, just to get the word out about Claire event and um, because we're always looking to you know partner with people and also constantly raising money as well to keep us afloat so it a lot is like a lot of different things going on at once yeah yeah you sound like you're wearing like three hats but before mm -hmm. before you wore those three hats Arf and you and I met when you we, we were in Cosmic which was basically an open source mm -hmm. collaborative group of engineers and physicians and Many of the professionals that aim to design and implement solutions to problems facing our healthcare systems during the first wave of COVID. And I never really asked you this, was engineering always your first choice? It actually wasn't. My first choice was architecture and architecture. I, I wanted to do something creative and it wasn't, um, my dad was in construction. So I always saw him like designing buildings and I was like helping him out doing um, all this construction stuff. And I really liked it watching him to, like do these drawings and design these buildings. I'm like, I want to go into architecture. And that was me at like five years old. I was just always into it. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, and then I did a lot of like side projects. And I even during high school, I was part of um, design groups where we would like design buildings and learn CAD software, like all by myself. And I was kind of, that was my path. And that my dad told me, he's like, you know, architecture, it's, it's hard to get a job in architecture. Maybe you should do engineering. And I looked into it a little bit. I looked into the process of becoming an architect and the long road. So I was like, okay, I'll start doing engineering and then I'll go into architecture afterwards. So I, you know, went to UBC, applied to engineering, um, didn't get in anywhere else except UBC. So I was like, it was meant to be. So I went to UBC. I was planning to go into civil engineering. Um, I was like dead set. Okay, I'm gonna do civil. And then I did an internship uh, after my first year of university with a civil engineer. And it was the most boring thing, <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> I was like, I 
cannot do this for the rest of my life. So that summer, as I was filling up my like applications for second year specialization, I switched to biomed because it was a new program and it was something, it, it was just something exciting. And I saw a lot of potential for creativity there as well. Um, Cause that was kind of my like guiding, guiding light or kind of, I didn't care what I did as long as it was creative at that point. Um, so uh, engineering was great, but in civil engineering, I felt like it was very monotonous. Uh, in biomedical engineering, I felt there was a lot more opportunity for innovation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you got a question? Sorry, I'm not sure. Are we doing two and two? Cool. Uh, yeah, how does architecture relate to biomedical engineering? Like in your head, there must be a link attached, okay. you know? Um, not a lot. The, so the reason I chose biomed was because I spent a lot of time in the hospital and a lot of my family are physicians as well. And I was just surrounded by that, the med lifestyle for uh, a long time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it was like something I was really aware of. So it, was, it wasn't, I guess the tie between architecture and engineering was just those are the two professions in my family. Um, uh, medicine, my uncle's side, my cousins all in medicine, and then um, construction, my sister's in like infrastructure, law, my dad is in construction. So those are the two things I've been exposed to my whole life. So I wanted to do something related to either of those. Um, and first it was architecture and then last minute switched to biomed. I think my question is more on the lines of, do you think there's a way to combine both? Hmm. It's a uh, interesting, I, you know, I've, I've thought of this before where I'm like, I really want to do something in architecture still, but I couldn't think of any way to actually combine architecture and um, biomed, specifically like medical devices. So, hospital. <laughs> really yeah, I mean, I mean, personal. Man. Like, but, go on. But that's that's a whole different. That's not that's not like biomedical engineering. Hospital. Biomedical engineering. No, but like the biomedical engineering. The sure. <laughs> no, but the building, the building itself. That's the architecture of it and then the i guess the layout would be architecture but then the actual devices being used within the like, hospital i don't know if that ties into the actual manipulating the physical space sure or like working with that it, it, with a biomedical lens like that gives you a very big upset i feel oh. i don't know so like i've I, heard that defined as clinical engineering versus biomedical engineering but I mean, okay, so Fair, this yeah. is, get back to the path. Let's get back to that. Okay, so, so, yeah. so, so you joined the biomedical engineering stream at UBC when I first started. So, I mean, yeah. as, as a newfound student or as a new student in a newfound program, what are the struggles and benefits of, of joining this like entirely like novel mm -hmm. environment? Um, it was interesting because the, there's a lot of feedback. There's like a mm -hmm. big, it was just the whole program just felt like a big feedback loop. So. The teachers would, the, the professors would teach something to us. And then a month later, they'd ask for our feedback, say like, how is it going? Do you like how the program's going? And then we would give a whole bunch of feedback to them. Um, we would have like every two months, we'd have a uh, town hall. So usually programs will have town halls every semester. They kind of, for our first year, they condense it to like doing it every two months, just so they could really modify the program as it's, as it's going through. So that, that part was really nice. Um, but being the first program, those modifications didn't really come directly to us. It was more the years after us. Um, so there was some stuff that worked really well where the, the classes were great. The stuff we were learning, it was a good balance of um, new knowledge versus good critical thinking. But then um, there was some stuff which was a bit too fast paced where the professors, they were kind of used to teaching more grad level classes or were used to teaching med classes. So the teaching style was a bit different. Um, uh, 
and didn't really wasn't really conducive to uh, engineering teaching. So, and then on the other side was some classes were a bit too easy. So I feel like they underestimated our ability and didn't give us, uh, I guess, enough work to do. Or I, I, I guess that's how I felt. Where some classes felt like a waste of time where I was going through them, but I didn't really feel like I was learning anything. Um, so overall, I think it was great where there was a combination of a lot of different perspectives being um, given like med school lectures, but also given engineering lectures, communications lectures. and um, But at the same time, it felt a bit overwhelming as well, where you're, you, know, you, you, kept, you kept after switching your brain. And every time you go a different lecture, you have to, it's a different teaching style, different examination style different learning style. So that part was a bit challenging, but overall the learning was pretty top quality. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that program was pretty popular overall, despite the fact that it was completely novel uh, because mm -hmm. you're in that new milieu of people wanting to join in on this new like buzz. What do you think kind of drew people together towards that new program, even though it was completely untested and at some points, probably, probably a bit early in its development. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it was, I think for me especially was the, like the cool aspect of it, like, ooh, biomedical engineering, so many possibilities. Um, <laughs> like, I feel like it was kind of, kind of a buzzword, honestly, where you can go into this program and start kind of mix your love of biology and engineering. Um, a lot of us, when we were going through the program, we kind of felt like it wasn't exactly what we wanted to do after a while because um, for someone like me I wanted to work in like med devices but the actual hands-on experience wasn't there a lot of it was theoretical and a lot of it was like in cellular development or in tissue engineering um, whereas maybe I'd be better off doing like mechatronics for example or mechanical engineering electrical engineering um, to work in medical devices so there was a bit of a uh, uh, like this false promise, I'd say, but I think what, back to the question, like what drew people to it? <laughs> um, I think it was mainly that, uh, just the buzzword of it, of biomedical engineering and also a lot of media coverage as well of, uh, when we joined, I think it was, I guess it was a year before COVID, but there was a lot of stuff around prosthetics, um, that was happening around then. Um, with like humanoid robots coming out and um, prosthetic limbs. Um, I think that was a big hype around there. Uh, at least a lot of the people that I talked to wanted to go into prosthetics. Um, that wasn't really where I wanted to be, but um, prosthetics was a big area that, that drew a lot of people in. I, I, I think that's, that's, it's an interesting pick because uh, I mm -hmm. did elect biomed. Mm. Uh, and then now I'm wrapping up uh, a biomed masters. I uh, worked okay. on medical devices through a boat. I probably mm -hmm. worked at five, six total, class two and three. And mm -hmm. the, the, the take here is I think this whole biomedical engineer that you see, their focus is more cellular than like, um, mm -hmm. let's call it electro biomedical engineer because once you go into biomedical engineering you're just opened up sort of like a, a treat you know there's yeah. so many different ways to, to, to engage the human yeah. with engineering or you know, you're just at that interface level and that's what makes it cool to me mm -hmm. so like this to, 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 there is one of the question what kinds of medical devices would you have place to work on? Um, I was, so I was actually in, um, I have this condition called bladder extrophy and it, I was born with like my bladder outside of my body and I use a lot of, um, well, I use catheters to, um, urinate, but I also have a lot of friends that use a lot of other devices like ostomy bags and, um, what else? Like a lot of people doing enemas. So there's these, there's all these devices that are surrounding uh, my condition. And that's where I first wanted to go into, like working with 
uh, like catheter development or ostomy development and actually did a, I was working on an ostomy bag. That was like the first project um, that I was working on. Um, and that, that was what drew me into it. But then once I got into the program, I learned of all the other possibilities uh, with biomedical engineering. And uh, it really opened up my perspective on the, like what the challenges are in, in biomedical engineering right now. Um, so I got really interested in like brain, um, like brain and device interfaces. So whether that be um, like neural stents or like active neural stents, passive neural stents, um, things for aneurysms, um, things to actually control the brain to help with um, the Alzheimer's or depression or things like that. So I, I got interested in that area and I did some work in that at local company here called Evasc. They were developing, uh, there is a passive stent for um, neural aneurysms, but uh, in the future where I want to go with this is in that area of developing like active, active neural stents that find that area super cool. I'm sorry, it's very circle of rockers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I should go delve deeper in, in like the biometric side or like, what do you think? I don't know. Um, I you feel guys... comfortable like engaging further here or like, should I switch topics? Um, yeah, we, we can, we can switch maybe add some, add some variety. Sure. Yeah. So. Tell me about Cosmo. Like I've heard of it. I just sure. yeah. So Cosmic started twenty twenty COVID. I think I joined in March. I'm not exactly sure what date it started, but around that time, like peak of COVID, and um, it started off with this gravity ventilator project. So it started with Dr. Chris Guan at UBC, um, along with two of his students, I believe. Um, one was a doctor and another engineer. So they came together and their goal was to make a ventilator for this global challenge that was happening at the time. Um, so their goal was to bring together as many people as possible, that being doctors, engineers, lawyers, business professionals, anyone that could help essentially to accelerate the development of a low cost ventilator. Um, I joined in kind of at the end stage of the development of this ventilator, but the group grew so large that there was, I mean, I think at, at its peak, it was probably like 150 or 200, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff. Um, but because of that, there were so many ideas floating around and so many problems that were uh, coming up from the doctors in the group being like, oh, we need this and there's a shortage here. We need help here. Like, can you help us? One of the things, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that got developed during that time in Cosmic. One of them was a uh, oxygen concentrator, um, a snorkel mask adapter for as a PPE. Uh, and there was a lot of just project ideas that were coming and going as well. Like it, prototype would get built and it wouldn't really go anywhere. Um, and then everything was open sourced. That was one kind of mission of Cosmic where they wanted to develop these devices, open source them, and then focus on outreach and advocacy around them to kind of spread awareness uh, so they can be used on site. And all the build instructions would be there. Um, they would make sure that it's like, can be made with simple materials that are available in most places. Uh, so one of the pro one of the things that was developed during Cosmic uh, by myself and um, kind of the support from the whole group was the bubble helmet, and that what I'm working on now with the helmet based ventilation. And during that time, we the development was so rapid. I think in four months we had a functional prototype that we had tested with like tens, twenty, like almost 20 physicians actually getting their hands on it. Um, and that kind of showed me the, 
th there were just so many people passionate about something and it accelerated the development so fast where we created this product, open sourced it and started, you know, talking to people in India, talking to people in Brazil, sharing our designs, being like, hey, we've like, we have these designs and you can start building it right now and start using it. We actually had some people in India who recreated our designs, people in Bangladesh as well and in Brazil. Um, didn't have any usage, but it was a definitely a good step. And then we also um, published all our designs on GitHub and uh, IEEE uh, Journal as well. So that's where Cosmic kind of ended. So at the end of, um, I wouldn't say at the end of COVID, the COVID's still around, but at the end of the kind of fear and shortages that COVID caused, um, Cosmic didn't really have that purpose anymore. So I think just recently they wrapped up, but there was a few spin-off companies from Cosmic. So one was ours, uh, the Claire event, and another one um, that was developing the oxygen concentrator. They also spun off of, uh, spun off of Cosmic and I'm not really sure where they're at. We'll meet like every couple of months, but they, they're really focused on development right now. They're looking for some like R and D grant last time I talked to them, um, much more complicated project. Ours was a lot simpler. So we had some money from cosmic that we uh, like got through donations and grants. Um, and we saw this opportunity of being able to take this device that we developed so quickly, which is so rare in the medical field. Um, and actually take it to market relatively, uh, relatively quickly. So where were you in your learning along your like undergrad career when this whole little thing about Clarivent happened and right. what did it feel like to go back into your undergrad after experiencing what really was an accelerated product development cycle during mm -hmm. what, is, what has been one of the greatest healthcare crises in the world? That, that mm -hmm. we remember. Yeah, I, so I joined Cosmic during my co-op term. I wasn't having a great time in co-op during that summer because <laughs> it wasn't what I wanted to do. I was working, I was supposed to be working in a lab, but because of COVID, it, got, it went remote. And then the PI I was working with wasn't really supporting me that well. So I had a lot of free time. Um, so that was my first co-op term after a third year of university when I joined Cosmic. And it was honestly perfect timing because we had learned all this like theoretical stuff, how to develop a medical device, um, but I didn't really get to apply it. And then Cosmic kind of forced me to apply it. And it was really nice as well, seeing where, like what skills I had learned as compared to um, people in other engineering fields. So a lot of the, medical device development process is it's similar to other device development but there's other like there's standards you have to follow and like risk management that you have to do and quality systems you have to follow so we actually learned all that um, during our degree and it was great to be able to apply that to um, developing a cosmic so that was sweet and then claire event started I want to say, yeah, it was May, 2021. I'm trying to see where that falls into my, to my degree, I guess fourth year, May 20. Yeah. It was a year before I graduated. So right at the end of my, um, at the end of my co-op terms, uh, started, started Claire event and that was like, what a great experience because it taught me so much of the business side, which you don't learn at all or very little bit in, in the engineering uh, degree at UBC, at least. So there's, we had one class, uh, at UBC, which taught us some, uh, some of the healthcare economic stuff, but kind of doing a deep dive into this, it was a lot of self-learning of how to start a medical device company. And, um, luckily had a lot of good mentors, some from cosmic and a lot of, a lot of it from connections through cosmic, getting all these like business mentors. And then UBC also had a program, um, entrepreneurship at UBC, which really supports this kind of stuff. So 
people coming from a more research background and jumping into business. So there's a lot of learning that had to be done right when uh, I started Claire Event, but uh, I'm so glad I did it because in relation to what my degree was teaching me, it was like I was getting a, a se separate MBA style degree on the side. Um, so, but yeah, going, so then after that, after I was done co-op, going back and into my final year of engineering, a lot of it is, at least what I noticed in fourth year there, like the technical electives and a lot of technical courses still, but a lot of it starts focusing on um, like development and development cycles and like how to get a device to market. Um, so there is a bit of entrepreneurship focus and business focus, not a lot still, but I felt like I had done so much of that learning in the past summer where I found my fourth year super easy after that. <laughs> There's uh, a lot of the stuff that, yeah, a lot of the stuff that they were teaching us in final year was I learned in like a four month period of working on Claire event. Um, besides the technical stuff, obviously, but uh, more just on the commercialization side. So it was, yeah, great experience. We, we've talked a little bit about the impact that the Claire event, I guess, process um, has had on your education. But could you really simply, as you would describe to a five-year-old, uh, tell us what exactly Claire event does? Mm -hmm. So we're making a big bubble that surrounds a patient's head and it connects to a flow, a source of air. Um, that could be a ventilator, it could be just uh, airflow from uh, a wall, but the goal is to provide oxygen and pressure to help someone breathe. And this could be, uh, it, the main use right now is in the intensive care unit. So intensive care units are, as you know, but uh, some people might not know is where very critically ill patients go. And it, it th this device would be used in cases where patients' lungs will be failing. So they're having a very hard time breathing and they just need that extra added support. So this bubble creates this environment uh, around the patient's head. All right. Fab, do any follow-up questions? Or keep having to have you nice little blank. Sorry. <laughs> How did you get the, the pressure part done? I'm actually curious. Yeah, so the there's a valve at the end. Um, I don't have one here, but it's a it's a resistance valve. So you just turn it and there's a spring in there and it controls the amount of airflow that goes out of the hood. And that creates a, a pressure within the hood. So does that make sense? So it's all mechanical. <laughs> It's all mechanical, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, so it's a spring that controls like this, um, like this uh, platform, essentially, which makes it more rigid or looser, where it constricts the airflow going out of it. How do you, okay, sure. How do you pass the <laughs> airflow if it's just a bubble? Uh, so there's like an inflow port, and then the... It's just path of least resistance. It ends up going uh, out the outflow. Yeah. But that's cool. Yeah. That's so it like goes in, circulates around the hood, and then goes out. Um, and you need to have pretty high flow rates as well to flush out the CO2 within the hood. So if you could but, redesign it, how would you, how would you change it? Yeah. I mean, that's what we're working on right now, but yeah, <laughs> they we're working on a few redesigns. Um, one of them is around the, well, let me talk about the ones that we're not working on because they, <laughs> they're, they're kind of they're f like future, future development. The ones we're working on right now, we're not uh, talking about too much until we get patents around it. But there's a few things that we're not immediately working on, but we would like to see in, in future hoods. So one of them is around the way it's secured to the patient. So right now, when you have airflow going in, it creates pressure and the pressure causes a force to push it up. So there needs to be something keeping it down. Um, 
And right now, how we're doing it is to have straps underneath the armpit. And that's how the other hoods work as well. And yeah, it, it kind of lifts the, the patient up and not comfortable, causes pressure sores. And especially if you're doing, if they need a higher pressure, then it gets even more uncomfortable. So yeah, some, something around there, making it, um, somehow making it more comfortable. But we had some ideas around using like a vest or doing some other way of securing it to the patient or even securing it to something else rather than the patient. But yeah, we're thinking that that would be a great uh, redesign. And then also right now when you need to put it on a patient, it you need two providers, so like two nurses or um, two RTs to do it. Because in, to open up the next seal, you need to have like essentially four hands. Because if you just do, um, if you just do it with two hands, then it creates like an oval. You need it to be completely open. So, yeah, somehow making the next seal adjustable or uh, having it, um, yeah, just so one provider can do it, or even maybe no providers, <laughs> have a robot come and do it. But how did you come to the conclusion that that's the part that needed fixing? Um, it, it was through Cosmic, essentially. So the doing all those physician interviews, and that was crucial to how we've converged to our design as well. Talking to the physicians, talking to nurses, talking to RTs. Because it is a new technology, there's not a lot of published research on it. So the only way we could really get feedback on it was by showing people and um, getting their feedback directly. And the people's feedback we took kind of at the highest rank was those nurses, those RTs that were dealing directly with the patient um, in terms of usability. So they're the ones that are handling it. Um, they'll, they're the ones that are actually administering it. So getting their feedback and making sure that the nurses and RTs are happy that's how we determined what features we want to incorporate within the hood. So you had mentioned that Cosmic is slash was open source. So how mm -hmm. the hell do you patent a technology that's open source? Or what, what, what was the mm. pathway that you had to take in order to make sure that you could build a company out of technology that you had previously made open source? Yeah. Um, honestly, we're still trying to figure that out because it's... Yeah, when, when we started it, it was, you know, open source. Everyone told us, they're like, no, there's no way you can make a company around this. You've already told everyone all your secrets. So we thought, screw them. We can try our best. <laughs> and we had seen some business models as well that had done open source technology, not in med tech, but in other, uh, like in software companies, I like even Tesla open source some of its stuff. So we've, we've seen it working in other fields and we thought, why not? Why not in med tech? Um, and then we realized the reason it's not possible to create an open source device in med tech was because you need a large investment to um, get a device to market. And the only way you can get investment is if you have, okay, not the only way you can get investment, but the easiest way to get investment is if you have some proprietary technology because of that long road to market. Um, and especially because this is a class two medical device, there's certain um, requirements we have to meet to get the device to market, which is very cost intensive. So what we decided to do, we tried raising some money and we tried approaching investors and um, going to you know, impact investors and going to the right people, but that was, I mean, that was the feedback we got. It's like, you don't really have anything proprietary, like someone's going to steal your technology and people didn't really feel comfortable investing. Um, so this is when we started talking with BCIT, they showed an interest in our technology. We wanted to, um, we, we knew some of the people here and we have had this goal. We're going to spend eight months and develop something based on the feedback we received during all our testing that we did and develop something proprietary. That is what we've been doing for the past eight months now. And now we've, we've reached something that's proprietary and then we can get patents. And now we can't 
patent the functionality of the device and we can't patent the stuff that we've um, published already, but everything we've developed now, we will be able to get a patent for. And that's kind of how we've gone around that um, to be open source plus patent to um, eventually create a, a viable business. But it was kind of a hard reality where you kind of have to secure your technology to get money unless you're very wealthy and you can invest your own money into it. But if you want to go to any external investors, you pretty much have to have a patent. Um, but that that being said, there is this other company that does open source medical technology, but they don't they haven't done it for any class two devices. It's only class one. Um, it, there's yet to be an open source class two medical device company. And I think we've we we've gotten as close as we can to it where we have an open source version and then a, a patent patented version as well. That wasn't your only challenge though, because like the, the whole mm -hmm. impetus for developing Clarivent was COVID. And again, as you said, COVID's not over, but there's much less outspoken media driven demand for ventilators and means to deliver oxygen to people with damaged lungs. So mm -hmm. now with so many more preventative treatments instead of tertiary quaternary treatments on board or a, a, mm -hmm. as necessary, uh, then how exactly you're sustaining a business model if the demand seemingly has dried up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we thought the same thing when we, there was like this dry period of six months once COVID was kind of, um, handled and cosmic was wrapping up. We thought, okay, we've, we've done our goal now, COVID's done and let's let this device die and let, let it live in the open source land. So yeah, in six months, we didn't even think about it. That was from like start of 2021 till till May of 2021. And then during that time, the doctors that were a part of Cosmic started reaching out to us. They're like, what's happening? Let's like, is this device ready to use? Like, what can we use it for our patients? And what we found was that even though COVID was drying up, there were so many other indications for uh, and use cases for this device that the doctors were excited about. And mainly, this was for COPD, so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, where patients will get flare-ups and end up in the ICU for a week to two weeks at a time, and then pulmonary edema as well. So these kind of two indications that I, mean, I didn't know about um, being from an engineering background, um, they, kept, they kept coming up whenever doctors would reach out to us and whenever, whenever we do outreach afterwards as well, because once this initial kind of push came from the doctors that were, that were from Cosmic, it was like, no, you, you, you should develop this device. You develop something good. Like you, um, even though COVID's over, like there's still use cases for it. Then we started reaching out to other doctors as well, um, just to make sure that it wasn't like a, a Cosmic bias and there was actual, there's actual demand for it. So started reaching out to other doctors that weren't part of Cosmic and same things, COPD, pulmonary edema. Those are the two big use cases that kept coming up. Um, and now that's the market we're really focused on. And infectious respiratory, respiratory diseases are also um, a, a big market, like with COVID still around, future respiratory diseases. Um, there's also influenza, tuberculosis. So there's, there is that subset of the market but it's nowhere near as big as the COPD market and the pulmonary edema market. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, we thought it was over as well. And then we realized there's this whole other big market that we inadvertently developed this for. How does your device relate to the competition for COPD? Like what is the current mm -hmm. treatment and how would your device help change that? Yeah. So right now it's mainly these big face masks that are being used. So they're called, sorry, non-invasive ventilation masks or CPAP masks. Um, and they go around the patient's face and they're strapped around the patient's head and it really presses on their face. The main problems with these are 
claustrophobia and uh, pressure ulcers that people get on their uh, on the sides of their face. And there's, I was I was reading some research on this. It's hard to find a number of intolerance, but um, some studies were showing thirty percent, some seventy percent, some even a hundred percent for prolonged usage. Uh, and COPD is where that prolonged usage happens. So I was reading this one study which showed after 72 hours of usage, 100% of the patients stopped using it because of the discomfort. So there's, yeah, a lot of discomfort there. So that's like where this helmet idea came from uh, initially. So we, just to give some context, we're not the first people to develop a helmet-based ventilation device. There was one developed back in, in 2002 to solve this problem exactly. Uh, that was developed in Italy. So that's where the inspiration, that's where we drew our inspiration uh, to develop our device as well. But there was a few downsides with that helmet that we wanted to address with ours. The main thing being a, a rigid neck seal. So during that time, the only thing that they were solving for uh, when they developed their hood was the the pressure ulcers to solve that. But then there was new research that came out during COVID, which showed that proning patients actually improved lung function and gas exchange. And it, it was, I, I'm not sure if it, the research came out during COVID, but it became, people became more aware of it. And actual, um, there was a lot of evidence that started popping up during COVID. So we saw that and that's when the doctors came to us and said, we want something like this hood, but without this, these rigid components on them. So that's where our design came from. So we've, the first thing that was being used was these masks and then helmets came in and we've kind of developed a, a newer, better version of the helmet. That's where, uh, our differentiator is. I guess to build up on that. Mm -hmm. Where do you see scale tie into play? What's, what's, yeah, like how is this scales? Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's going to be like, we're just going to be selling to directly to the hospitals. So when, when we are ready to scale, it'll be more, more so of a, of a manufacturing um, thing and the, the manufacturing of our hood is quite simple. So we most likely have to find a manufacturer that could do large scale manufacturing. So that'd be one problem that we would need to solve. Um, but then to actually scale up, it would be getting more hospitals on board. And what I've heard is when the hardest part is getting your first, like first few customers in the hospital, uh, hospital game, at least. So no one wants to be the first one to try out a medical device. So the scale part doesn't seem as challenging as getting those first, you know, 50 customers or first 50 hospitals to try to use our device. So once, um, once it becomes kind of accepted by these like key opinion leaders or thought leaders in the field, then, um, and we start publishing more about it. And one of our goals is to generate a lot of evidence and publish around this technology as well. So that'll lead heavily into adoption. So we're going to start doing these studies, start working with physicians and get these thought leaders on board. And then once that happens, it, it scaling up will be more so a manufacturing and distribution thing after that. The, to begin closing off the conversation, I, I understand that you've really based the last few years of your career and education off of your unique experience with Clarivent, but mm -hmm. there's such demand for, I guess, biomedical engineers, at least as I perceive, because there's such an interest in biomedical technology in the years post pandemic. So why not go to already an already established company and know, have a comfortable, uh, and still productive and creative life with another company. Why go with Clarivent instead with all the seemingly insurmountable challenges that we already listed in this conversation? Mm -hmm. Um, I, 
I worked with a couple, like during co-ops, so mostly during my internship times, I worked with um, different scale companies, like some small companies, some large companies, some research labs. And there was this level of monotony, which came with it, where I was just being told what to do. I did it and I wasn't thinking about it afterwards, which was nice. But I also saw all these people working on startups and working on their own businesses and working in that whole startup field. And as I got more integrated into it, and as I was talking to these people, I just saw such a level of excitement. And I was like, I want to be a part of this group of people. They're so excited. They're so youthful. And there's so much, there's just so much um, curiosity. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, I was like, I want to be part of that group of people. <laughs> so um, now that I kind of am, part of that group of people, I can see the excitement around it where there's, yes, there's the uncertainty and yes, there's the, it's like very risky and all that, but all that just outweighs, well, the, the excitement outweighs all that. It just keeps me, it gets me out of bed. Like I'm so excited every day to be working on this. Um, and I mean, I'm not the only one working on it. I have my co-founder of Yona as well. Like and then we have some physicians who are on our team as well. And that, um, you know, tight knit team, um, and ownership of a project, like it, it's just so much more exciting than when I was working at a company where I felt, didn't really feel that ownership, didn't really feel any responsibility. Um, so yeah, that honestly, that's it. Maybe in the future when I, <laughs> when I don't have this energy anymore, uh, go work at a bigger company. But right now I feel like I have so much opportunity to do something risky and do something with um, so much uncertainty because I don't have too many other responsibilities like a family. So I just want to take advantage of that now. And then maybe in the future, I'll do something a bit more stable. Mm -hmm. So before we close off, I always give our guests an opportunity to plug their pluggables. What can the audience do for you to make sure that Claire event helps people breathe better and also mm -hmm. potentially, I really hope, helps them scratch their noses while they're, <laughs> while, while they're being thrown. Yeah. I mean, our, our biggest challenge now and always is uh, financial stability. So um, I don't want to, I don't want to say we're like looking for investment here, but we're looking for investment. <laughs> um, but then besides that, we're also always looking for um, positions. Like we want, we want constant feedback. So physicians, nurses, RTs, like those are the kind of people we want to talk to right now. Um, and also people in just in the hospital network kind of higher up. So people who deal with purchasing. Um, so we're really trying to talk to as many of those people as possible because we want to develop, like in the, at the end of the day, we're developing the device for them. So we just want to get as much feedback as possible. So yeah, like if you know anyone or if anyone listening knows anyone uh, in respiratory care or in the healthcare field, yeah, we, we would love to talk to them. Sounds great. Thanks for the chat. Mm. Yeah, thanks guys.